Hello, everybody, and welcome to Charity Radio. Hope everybody's keeping safe and well. Uh, so I'm delighted to have in our studio this evening, in our virtual studio, we've Eric Donovan. So Eric is a boxer from a Thai. He first won at the Irish title at 11 years of age. He is a five-time Irish senior champion. Eric turned pro in 2016. He's had 14 fights, 13 victories. And on May 14th, he's fighting for the European super heavyweight fight uh, in Italy. Um, so very welcome, Eric. How are things? <laughs> Very good, Dave. Thanks for having me. Um, I just think, uh, you know, uh, super, super, super featherweight, <laughs> not super heavyweight. Super featherweight, my apologies. <laughs> I, I, I was adding a couple of stone onto you there. I'm probably eating like a super heavyweight at the moment and I, I, I need to actually cut back because I'm going to have, uh, I'm going to have to make nine, snow, or nine stone four pound in about five more weeks. So yeah, it's going to be tough. Good stuff, yeah. So is it about 57, 58 kg? Is that what you're, what weight you're fighting? 59. 59. 59. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's talk about the fight. So first and foremost, anyway, Eric, I appreciate your time. I know you're a busy man. So May 14th, it's Mario Alfano. It's in Brescia in Italy. He's an Italian fighter, right? So you're fighting in his backyard. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Good stuff. So how's the training going? Oh, training's going great. You know, training's going so, so well so far. And uh I keep myself in shape. I'm always ready. I don't just have to get ready when I get the phone call. You know, um, my manager, my coach, they all know um, that I'm ready to go at any time. So when we got the when we got the call to say, you know, you're you're in the mandatory position, Eric. I got the call at the end of December. It was actually the actually I got an email on the last day of 2020, and you can imagine 2020 was such a disaster year for so many people. Like and even for me and my fiance on a personal level, we were supposed to get married that year and I promised so much. And anyway, it was a disaster year. But on the final day of that year, the 31st of December, I get an email from the Boxing Union of Ireland to tell me I'm mandatory position for the European title. And uh, so I made a decision that 2021, I'm going to make sure that I'm going to be ready in the gym all the time. I'm going to, I'm going to, prepare meticulously, look after my mental health, look after my physical health, and just be ready for this because this could spring upon me at any time. So for the last four months, I've been working away, working hard, keeping the body in great nick. And then only last week, well, two weeks ago, we got the official date for the fight as the 14th of May. And I believe that it's going to be uh, a dream come true for me to, to go to Italy, to Brescia, into Alfano's backyard, put on a clinic performance and become a European champion. Brilliant, fair play. I love the confidence, Eric. Uh, just in terms of boxing style, right? So do, from the few fights I've seen from you, your style seems to be a good counter puncher. You're elusive. You seem very, very hard to hit and you're a strategic boxer. Um, so how, how does the, the, the styles contrast in terms of uh, Alfano? Yeah, like Alfano is a kind of a, he's a, he's a small stocky compact type of fighter who has um, a very powerful punch and very very physical he's a very physical fighter wouldn't have the same kind of footwork as me or hand speed as me and probably I would probably be superior in terms of my boxing IQ as well I think I would trump him there but he's still a very dangerous opponent and he is a long like the longer the fight goes on the, the better he becomes so it's a 12 round fight and I've never boxed a 12 round fight before. In fact, I've never even boxed any further, any more than eight rounds. Um, so it's going to be four rounds. The fight is scheduled for four rounds longer than I've ever boxed before, you know, and people might think, gosh, a four rounds is only a small thing, but four rounds is 12 minutes extra of boxing on top of, you know, the furthest you've ever boxed before. So it's a long, long time. Um, but I'm ready. I'm prepared, and I believe that with the right tactics and the right strategies, um, I can win this fight uh, by using my skills, my experience, and and my intelligence. And I have a very good coach as well, who's been there a long time, uh, Packy Collins. Packy, guys, is Stephen Collins' brother, right? Yeah, yeah. So he's he he's been around for a long, long time, and I'm very lucky to have his experience in the corner. Perfect, because I know you started off with Kenneth Egan, right? And mm -hmm. Kenneth, you say, is still in the coaching setup, but Packy's taking over really is the main point of contact, is it? Yeah, like I worked with a lot of coaches from the start of my boxing career. My own amateur coach, Dominic O'Rourke, kind of started off on this journey with me and 
after Dominic O'Rourke, I worked with the stories, Jerry Story Senior and Junior, you know, Belfast, they would have brought, yeah. yeah, Belfast, Belfast men, very, very experienced men, great, great men who would have uh, brought Carl Frampton up to the European title at the start of his career. And then I linked in with Andy Lee for a fight. And then, then I've been working with Kenneth Egan then for, uh, I think it was probably uh, the last three or four fights uh, before I linked up with Packy. Um, and Kenneth, I've worked with Kenneth the longest and we had great success together. We won the Irish title together and Ken is a friend of mine as well. So it was lovely to share that experience with him. But, you know, at the same time, I believe that self Barrett fight last year on Sky Sports, I gave everything I had, but it just wasn't enough. And we trained so hard and we worked so hard together, me and Ken, for so long. I just felt like I needed something different. I needed a little bit more uh, experience. I needed to know what to do when I get into the business end of these fights because I came unstuck against self Barrett. I came, uh, I'd, I'd run out of ideas. Mm. So I need that experience. You know, I need that experience in the corner. And I just said, I'm probably in the final stages of my career. I'm, 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 I'm aware of that. I'm conscious of that. I probably, I don't really know how many fights I have left, but I know I'm in the final chapters and I just don't want to have any regrets. Make so I linked up, yeah, linked up with Packy and, you know, so far it's been, it's been really good. But there are all those people, all those coaches that I mentioned, they've all been a part of this journey, this redemption story. And uh, I'm, I'm very grateful for them, uh, okay. for each and every one of them. But just on the Zelfa Bar- Barrett fight, I mean, you lost in the eighth round. He seemed like a strong puncher, but the, I'd say the positives you could take from it is in terms of your chin. I mean, he was hammering you a lot in, in the eighth round and you weren't going down. Now, eventually you did go down, but you it clearly showed you're able to take, you know, take a punch. Yeah. Yeah. I showed my resilience and I showed that I could take a punch, but like, and I took, I took a lot of them. I took a lot of them. He put me down. The very first punch he put me down with in the seventh round was a cracker. It was an absolute cracker, and I walked onto it. Like, you know, you have to give him credit for it. I, I, I had to get lucky every time. He just had to get lucky once. Mm. And he, walked, he, he threw his whole body behind that punch. He actually moved. He turned. He's an orthodox fighter. He turned. He stepped into an, a, almost a southpaw position, whipped in his left hook, and I walked straight onto it and it just shook me to my to the core. Oh. And yeah, and I just hit the ground and put like that fighting spirit is always there. It's alive inside. And I just jumped up and I probably jumped up too quick, Dave. I didn't really, I didn't have the experience to know what to do at that time. It was more of a shock, I think, that I just jumped up. And I probably should have stayed in the ground for about four or five seconds or, got, or just stayed down on one knee or something and, and got a, just could try and, gather myself to regroup and, and step, step up. But I jumped up too quickly, didn't really recover, saw out the rest of the round, but he put me down again near the end of that round after a barrage of punches that were not really as, they weren't, they weren't landing clearly, or cl- as clearly. they weren't as clinical as the first one. They were just glancing punches, glancing blows that were just coming like, you know, and hitting the side of the head. And then it was just the force of them and the, the onslaught, the relentless onslaught, it just made me go down again. Mm-hmm. And when I got to the end of the seventh round, I didn't really, I didn't really recover. I went out for the eighth round and I probably, I probably was still concussed. I was probably still concussed. And then I walked on to another shot and look, that was it's it. But it's, I think all, that, it's all a learning curve. And you said like, going mm-hmm. down, you probably, you would have gone down and stayed down a little bit longer. It's just about being a bit cuter. And I suppose you, you just get that with the more fights you have. Yeah, massive learning, massive learning. I know the next time I the next time I'm in that situation, I'm going to know what to do. And yeah. that's what it is. Life is about learning. Life is a journey, you know, and it's a journey full of of experiences. And that experience is one that I'm going to take a lot from going into my next one. Perfect. Yeah. Can I skip back to growing <laughs> up in a tie, right? You've mentioned Dom O'Rourke, who's obviously been an mm. influential figure throughout your life. You started boxing very, very young in St. Michael's in a tie. You won a national title at 11 years of age. You five times mm. your Irish senior, senior champion. So showed a lot of pedigree from a very, very early age. So do you want to just tell us firstly how you got into boxing? Yeah, well, I got into boxing by just... Uh, the club was just on the outskirts of the estate that I grew up in. I grew up in a place called Clamullion in the Thai County Clare. And, um, 
I followed my two older brothers down to the club. I wasn't allowed down. My mother was totally against it. She said I was too young and it was too rough and everything. But you're a young, rebellious, mischievous kid like myself. I just didn't really listen or do what I was told. And uh, I followed the boys down in any way. And uh, sure, that, the minute I walked in, I just absolutely loved it. I fell in love with it. The noise, the smell, the atmosphere, everything. It was just incredible. And, you know, it wasn't long before a coach realised how good I was. And he convinced my mother to allow me to come back down and, and I just kicked on from there. I was only seven years old. By the time I turned 11, when, you know, you, you can't box competitively till you're 11 years old. So when I turned 11, I had four years experience under my belt. And uh, and I won everything then from 11 all the way up. And uh, lucky enough to, to become our, uh, a Thai's first ever senior All-Ireland champion. I remember being in the National Stadium. I did a white collar boxing with Carl O'Grady. Yeah. And I remember oh, seeing yeah. kids on the bag. They were eight, nine years of age and they'd frighten you, their technique and their speed. It was just yeah. incredible watching them. So you were obviously at that level as well at a very young age. Yeah, I was, you know, and uh Cottle's a great, great man as well. Yeah. And uh, you know, he's doing he, you know, he had a great career as well. And I was very lucky actually to train alongside Cottle and he coached me, you know, he was at the world, he was my coach for the world juniors in Korea. And uh, we had a great, great training camp in Germany and I was in another training camp with him in Finland as well. So I have a good lot of memories and good experiences with Cottle O'Grady. But, but that's it, you know, yeah, I excelled. I was a young prodigy. I'd done so well. And, um, you know, looking back now, boxing was easy for me. Uh, I, enjoy, I expressed myself through boxing, you know. Mm -hmm. Family life, social life, education, they, all those things were difficult. But, but boxing, oh no. That's where I was. That's where I came into my own. I excelled okay. in there. Excelled, right? Perfect. But it was it wasn't without these glitches, right? So I know two big regrets you'd have in terms of the Beijing Olympics and then later on in the London Olympics, uh, 28, uh, 2008 and 2012, yeah. respectively. You didn't qualify for either of them. I think you were one fight away from qualifying in Beijing. Mm -hmm. You lost to an, Ita an Italian. Mm -hmm. And then you had an injury mm -hmm. in 2011. Uh, you, I think you got into a fight um, and it, it didn't allow you to, to, to box in 2012 or qualify for the Olympics. Do you want to just tell us about the kind of heartache about mm -hmm. not qualifying for both of them? Yeah, it was. It was difficult. Um, the first one around was probably a bit, uh, I was probably too, so young. I was only 22 years old. Um, I'd done really well to get into a position where one more win would have qualified me for the Beijing Olympic Games. I won two fights, boxed out my skin. And then, of course, I lost to the Italian. And the sad thing about that was I had beat the Italian before, mm. but I just let the whole occasion get to me. And something that really bothered me um, or that I struggled with throughout my life, not as much today because I'm, I'm able to talk about it, but a thing called imposter syndrome. So I felt like the night before the Olympics, I started thinking about what the Olymp or the night before that qualify the qualifying uh, fight, I started to think about the Olympics in a very different way uh, than just, a, than just a, a boxing tournament. I started to kind of, maximize it and amplify it and make it bigger make it a bigger thing than it actually was and then i started thinking about um do i deserve it and you know and this imposter syndrome is a very negative uh voice that is like the chip on your shoulder that's trying to pull you down and put you down and i know where that comes from it comes from my upbringing it comes from the background i'm from because in my community where i where i grew up I never see people succeed. Mm. I never saw I never saw people step out onto that platform and exceed at the very top level. And it was more comfortable for for me to fail. Uh, so, and then at that time, even when I was only twenty two, I was engaging in a lot of self destructive behavior as well, drinking, smoking, drugs, in my in my past times. Okay, so. All of that kind of behavior is not conducive to a professional athlete. So I started, I was starting to face the consequences of my life habits and behaviors. And then the voice started to get stronger and stronger uh, in my head. And it was like, you don't deserve this. You're not going to do it. You're not professional enough. You're not disciplined enough. I had great talent, great ability, but like that was it. I just, I just didn't perform when it came to it. And before I knew it, it was all over. And I was in the dressing room and I was devastated, but I was young. I, I, you know, I believed that I could get back there in four years time. I'd be my, my club coach, Tom O'Rourke, he told me, you know, 
Eric, you're only a young kid, like, you know, you're going to have so much experience come the London Olympic Games and you're going to learn a lot from, 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 this, from this whole tournament. And I believed him and I believed the hype and I got back on track and, and I was doing well for a long, long time. Um, but every now and then I would, I would fall through the, I would slip through the cracks, you know. I just did not know how to, I did not know how to uh, ask for help or how to um, obtain that help or how to, how to kind of, uh, what would you say? I was living in denial. I was living in denial and I couldn't accept what was going on for me. And, and that was it. I was suffering in silence, basically, Dave. I was suffering in silence. And in 2011, I broke my hand outside of the ring in an incident that uh, was just absolutely devastating because um, it happened so quick and it was so silly. And it was just, you know, drink. Drink was a big factor in it. And uh, and it did... So it's, just, just it, to, to, to clarify on, on that piece, yeah. so um, Eric, yeah, so 2011, so you, you basically, you went out, you probably went on the tear and you mm. got into a fight basically because you broke your hand and obviously yeah. when you broke your hand, you can't fight, you you, were, you couldn't qualify obviously for the 2012 Olympics, was that no. it, yeah? Yeah, I was in pole position, I would have been seeded because in 2010 I became the European bronze medalist, uh, European bronze medal winner, so I was the top 10 in the world and number three in Europe going into 2011 and there was a new seeding system in place for the Olympics now, which wasn't in place for Beijing, mm. but it was going to be in place for London. And it meant that if I, if I can just get into this qualifier, I'm going to be seeded and I'll avoid all the top dogs and should get an easy passageway through to London. But sure enough, I went out on the town for one last night with a few friends and, uh, and very normal thing to do, very legal thing to do, you know, uh, and I say for, for normal people, but, I always crossed that invisible line. I never knew when enough was enough. And anyways, I, I went back to a house party and uh, and uh, this is in 2011, not long before the qualifiers actually, not long before I was due to go into my final training camp. And I get into a fight, an incident that happened literally, uh, that was over in about 15 seconds and my left hand was broke. And, 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 uh, and that was it. My Olympic dream was shattered and it was all over. So. And there you That's were it. watching Sometimes. Katie Taylor, obviously, in 2012. London being so close to Ireland, there was a huge Irish contingent over there uh, mm. cheering on Katie. It must have been kind of bittersweet then watching her, see, seeing her get the goal, thinking, Christ, I could have been there, you know? Yeah, well, uh, I know, yeah, bittersweet in the sense that, like, yes, I, I was good at it. There's no doubt about it. I was good at that I wasn't there. Um, but I was absolutely delighted for my teammates and for the success that they had. And uh, because I know how hard they work and I know how hard boxing is as a sport. It's a very, very difficult sport. And anybody that steps into the ropes deserves a hell of a lot of credit. And, um, but I was also Katie Taylor's sparring partner for that Olympic game. So it was, it was nice to be able to be a small part of her journey as well and her, her story. My hand was, I was back punching by the time the Olympics came around and I flew to Italy uh, to the Katie's training camp and to the Irish boxing team's training camp and I spent two weeks there sparring with Katie to help her to prepare for Sofia Ochigava who is a southpaw like me who is elusive and um, a counter puncher and kind of a stylish southpaw a bit like myself so I went over to help her to prepare for Ochigava and uh, thankfully um, she, she got the job done and became Olympic champion yeah. phenomenal achievement and post 2012 then Eric was did you spiral in terms of your mood where were you at kind of mentally oh mentally I was in a bad place after that I just kind of got really really down the dumps uh, actually got down the dumps in the beginning uh, end of 2011 and beginning of 2012 I just started to kind of really um feel like I, there was no purpose in, for me in there in, in life and uh, I really 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 went into a very deep dark depression and went into a big dark hole and very very uh, very dark place and I wouldn't wish it upon anybody um, I just didn't feel like there was a place for me in life Dave you know I didn't feel like I was capable or uh, incompetent enough to stand up on my own two feet and and to to be successful in any other department, you know, boxing just became everything to me and boxing was my whole identity. And suddenly I, I was failing at that miserably, you know, and I was kicking the people in the teeth who were looking after me and trying to support me and do well, like my family, my coach. And 
yeah, and at that point, I just felt like, what was the point even being here, you know? But, um, you know, the early 2012, I, I, I reached out and asked for help. I asked for professional help, and uh, best thing I ever did. Best thing I ever did. I got straight with Eric. I came face to face with Eric, and I said, enough of this nonsense. Let's get real. And I started to speak, and I started to speak not in a cliche way, not in a, in a very, uh, what would you say, kind of a glancing way, straight up authentic talking about what was going on for me, what I was feeling, what I believed, what I thought. And then I started to unravel all of the, the emotional turmoil, the mental turmoil that I was going through and started to get some direction again and clarity in my life. Mm. And once I got that, then I always believed there was only one avenue open to me. When I started to get some identification of other areas of my life, other abilities that I had, I, I started to see different options and different choices and different avenues open up to me. That it wasn't just to, boxing, as you said. It like wasn't your, just your boxing. identity was so wrapped up in boxing. Yeah. Yeah. There's more to me as a human being than boxing. You know, and that boxing is not, it doesn't have that hold over me today. It's something that I do and I do very well. But it's not my, it's not, it's not Eric Donovan. Eric, there's more to Eric Donovan, you know. So, and that um, probably frees you up there, Eric, just on that. That probably frees you up then from pressure in the ring. Say, look, the, there's more to your life than just boxing. So the same level of expectation isn't on your shoulders. Absolutely. Yeah. And I feel like there's a purpose now today. When I talked about not feeling like I had a purpose, today I do have a purpose, you know. Mm. And, uh, you know, I went back into education because that was something that I gave up on when I was only a teenager. You know, I was only 14, 15 when I left school. And, you know, I had such a fear around education. I had such a bad experience around ed education, but I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready at that time. And I didn't come from a place where education was um, encouraged or supported or, you know, there was no real emphasis or importance put onto it. So at 27 years of age, I went back into education as a mature student and then I was ready. And what, did you, what, did you, what did you do with 27, Eric? I went back to study counselling and psychotherapy. So it was an area that an area that gave me so much. And I just thought, well, I want to get back in here and be able to pass, you know, on what was what was given to me. Um, and I'd love to be able to help somebody else out along along the way. Um, so yeah, no, it's 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 almost it all happened so naturally. It was a natural, uh, yeah, segue. Can yeah. I just say, but obviously boxing was in the blood. I mean, you that's what you were born to do in some ways. Mm. 2016, then you decided to return, uh, not not amateur, obviously pro. So mm. tell us about that. Like what kind of prompted you to go back late in life, really, into the pro boxing scene and how has it been going for you? Well. I was three years in retirement from 2013 to 2016. And that was the, I went back into education, everything like that. So I started to kind of go in a different direction in life. I kept the training up. I kept a little bit of sparring up for my old coach. I'd help him out every now and then, but there was no, no competition. I wasn't being competitive in any way. And, you know, I, I kind of had a lot of regrets, a lot of regrets, a lot of, a lot of, I felt, I felt, sorry for myself a lot a good lot and I was thinking back and I was reflecting and you know it always reflect with oh what if or I should have done this or should have done that and it was all it always seemed to be a painful reminder and then it just dawned on me that hey I'm only 30 years old and now I have a new mindset and now I have a new you know I have a bit of an education to fall back on I, 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 I'm healthy I'm in recovery I'm not in addiction anymore I have a lot of experiences and I achieved an awful lot as an amateur, but I was doing an awful lot. My life was in a mess, but I still achieved. And now the shackles are off. Imagine I could, what, what could I do now? You know, and it was more like, um, it was more like redemption, unfinished business. Let's go and let's, let, rather than talking about it and thinking about it, let's do something about it. And that was it. And I turned pro in 2016. I said, you know what? I'm going to finish this, my boxing story honestly and with integrity and just be fully true to myself and when I hang the gloves up I want to be able to reflect back and say I did it to the best of my ability and I did it with great honesty integrity and true uh, true true to my word and that's it and here I am five weeks away from becoming a European champion so it's it's look I couldn't story, have asked yeah. I couldn't have asked for anything more I'm absolutely thrilled and and there's a lot of people that helped me to get into this position too and 
I'm so grateful to have people in my life. Just in terms of an unconscious of time here, Eric, as well, I know you're a busy man. Uh, just in terms of your pro record, I mean, you've only lost once. You've won 13 mm. times. I watched the Horvat fight. He was the Hungarian mm. boxer. And the mm. two of you, when you're in the way in, like, he looked taller. I think he was three quarters of a stone heavier. So he was a yeah. bigger man. And mm. I like the way your approach, right? Because I think the first round or two, you were just sussing him out to see what he was mm. made of. And he came at you like straight away yeah. from the first bell. But he was yeah. wild, you know what I mean? He was swinging wildly, but mm. you sussed him out and then you knocked him down in the fourth round, I think, even though he was a bigger mm. man, you know? So mm. it, was a, it was cute, mm. clever boxing. Yeah, yeah, huge man. I remember yeah. my coach telling me to weigh in, at, to come in a bit light, like, because... We started off at lightweight, which is 60, 61 kilo, but we wanted to, we wanted to head down towards the featherweight division. And he just said, like, each fight we'll try and come in a little bit lighter. And Horvat was supposed to come in at a certain weight, but he came in a lot heavier. Now, I could have said, no, listen, I'm not fighting him. It's too bad. He's too heavy. And I could have axed the whole show there. But I sold a lot of tickets, and there was a lot of people coming to watch me. And if I cancelled that fight, then there would have been no fight. And, you know... Um, I would have upset a lot of people. So I said, look, I'll do this and I'm going to have to be smart. But he was a beast and he really tried to take my head off and I could feel the power and I could feel the wind of his punches going by my head. And I was just like, oh God, I'm going to have to navigate, keep focused there. But anyway, finally I got to him and I stopped him in the end. But I remember hitting him, uh, I think it was the second, third round, I hit him with a peach of a body shot. It was an unbelievable shot. It was so sweet. It was just right on the money. And he went down and I said, he's not getting back up. And then he was down. He was flat out on the ground. And what does he do on the count of four? He rises up like a phoenix out of the ashes. And I was like, oh, my God, what the hell is going on here? And anyway, a few, a, a few more shots after, I was able to kind of finally take him out. But I got a fright. I got a fright in that fight because he was, he was a fierce... Uh, Fierce, formidable opponent, but another one, another notch to my to my record. He was, yeah, yeah. yeah so good stuff. So, so fourteenth of May. So we're a couple of weeks mm. out. So, how are you kind of mentally? I mean, physically, you seem to be in top shape mm. for it. How are you prepared mentally, or where's your head at now at the moment? Yeah, my head's in a good place. You know, I have, like I said, I, I have all the supports that I need, and I'm able to tap into them. I'm able to be. Um, uh, fully honest with myself and to reach out to whatever area I need. Uh, you know, support with, you know, uh, whether it's mental, physical, emotional. Um, I have a good support network around me and I'm using that and utilizing all of that. And come the 14th of May, it's just going to be me versus Alfano and it's going to be who performs the best on the night. And I am fully ready to succeed this time. When I talked to you earlier about not being ready to succeed in my life, it was, I was, it was more comfortable failing uh, because failing was something that uh, I, I suppose I was used to uh, from seeing many people fail around me uh, all, all my life. And so now, now I'm ready to step out onto that, uh, onto that platform and succeed at the highest level and become a European champion. Brilliant, fair play to you. And I won't keep you too long, Eric, but I'm just on about person, your personal life seems to be going very well anyway. So you were telling me before we went on air there that you... You're meant to walk down the aisle twice in the last couple of years, but obviously with COVID, the, the marriage, the, the wedding has been put on hold temporarily. Yeah, I always say it, you know, my fiance Laura, she's so elusive. Um, <laughs> she's, like I, you in the, she's like you in the ring, so Eric. Well, I think she's a bit better than me now. If I had her elusive skills, I'd be world champion by now, Dave. That's the truth. So two times I tried to catch her and two times she's after slipping by. Uh, third time no, lucky, so right? Third time lucky. Third time lucky, please, in October. Yeah, so um, I know we're, we're 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 so looking forward to it, and we hope that October will go ahead. Yeah, we we've been upset on two occasions so far. Um, it was supposed to be Spain, July twenty twenty, and then we postponed it to April, uh, twenty twenty one. But now we have to give up on Spain as a dream holiday destination, unfortunately. So we're going to get married back closer to home here, uh, in October, and uh, hopefully we can get the only thing the only worry that we have now is that numbers we hope that we can get good numbers at our wedding mm. because we'd hate we'd hate we'd hate to have to uh cut Take down <laughs> yeah we'd hate oh we just wouldn't like that but anyway it's hard to know we're only in april it's not till october fingers crossed 
Fingers crossed. Well, I think everyone should be vaccinated anyway by that stage. So fingers crossed you can have a decent. We'll vaccinate them ourselves if they're not. Yeah. We'll... <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. Well, look, Eric, it's an absolute pleasure talking to you, and I wish you all the best on uh, May 14th. So congratulations again, and we'll, we'll chat soon. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate Brilliant. it. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Eric. All the best.